All right, today Matthew Mullins is going to talk to us about the formula for quadratic pseudo-stable Hodge integrals. Thank you for the introduction, Aaron. So, for those that don't know, I work in intersection theory, which, very broadly speaking, uh, studies the intersection of different objects. If I have an object here and an object here, what does their uh, intersection look like? And what separates one person, those intersection theory, from another is often uh, what objects are they intersecting. In my case, it's pseudo-stable curves. Um, but they're all different kinds of things you can, you can intercept. And as for the, the rest of the title, uh, uh, Hodge integral, we'll get to uh, in a little bit, but a Hodge integral is a, a tool for computing certain intersections. And along with Renzo, we um, have come up with a formula for computing certain types of pseudo-stable Hodge integrals that are quadratic in some sense. Uh, but I want to start today by talking about the landscape of uh, different theories and different types of um, objects you can, you can do, look at in intersection theory and where pseudo-stable curves fit in that. So to start, at one end of the spectrum might be uh, gromov witten theory. Whenever you hear the words gromov witten theory, think that it has some loose connections to physics. Uh, especially string theory. I guess there are, there are objects out there in string theory that are you know, extra dimensional and, and uh, they want to study them and it often becomes a, a geometry problem. Uh, and in gromov witten theory, they usually study stable curves. And a stable curve is a curve that's a uh, connection, well, it doesn't have to be, but it can be a connection of several curves. And these curves can have holes in them, which uh, add to the genus. And they can also have uh, marked points, which are points we deem to be special, and those, um, you know, for connecting different stable curves together. Maybe I've got something over here. Another point, another marked point. Two, three. And we say a curve is stable if each component uh, satisfies uh, the stability condition. Stability condition. And the uh, stability condition, uh, one part of it, is that if you have a component of genus zero, uh, then you need at least three uh, marked points uh, or nodes. So for example, this component's genus zero, I didn't draw any holes in it, it has one, two marked points, and one node, that's where they, they connect, so it's got three uh, special points in total, so this is uh, stable. And if g is equal to one, uh, we need at least one marked point or node, and it's usually not an issue because uh, if we have a component that's genus one, it's a, if it's attached to something, it's always got at least one marked point or node, and so it's usually good unless you have a, a torus by itself. Um, and finally, uh, along with these other two conditions, uh, the only singularities that a stable curve has uh, are nodes. Singularities are nodes. So there's no, no cusps, no other uh, uh, funny business other than uh, nodes. So we say that they're, they're at worst nodal. Uh, and because of this, uh, stable curves are generally pretty nice. Right? They, they don't have a lot of uh, singularities beside these, these nodes. So this is one end of the uh, intersection theory spectrum. Uh, if this is as nice as it gets, maybe as, as uh, dastardly as it could get, is in Donaldson-Thomas theory. And in Donaldson-Thomas theory, they, they study these unimaginable cosmic horrors, otherwise known as Hilbert schemes. Why are they unimaginable cosmic partners? They have lots and lots of singularities. Lots of, oh, of types of singularities. That's not, yeah, that, that was not a, a technical term. Uh, they're just, uh, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum uh, uh, of stable curves. Um, and I won't draw them, you know, for, for your own safety, but, uh, you know, I'll just put a spooky ghost here to denote that this is like the other side of the, the curve counting theory. It's about as bad as it can get. So if this is the spectrum from they stable be, curves... They can be non-reduced. Oh, okay, yeah. For example. Sure. Even. 
Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Every play can be singular. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, spooky indeed. Um, so this is the spectrum. Uh, where do uh, what falls in the middle here? Uh, well, among other things, might be uh, pseudo-stable curves. And uh, as the name suggests, they're not too far away from a stable curve. With one of the big uh, differentiating uh, features being that they can have uh, cusps. That's what that is. That's a cusp. They can still have holes. They still have marked points. They can still be, you know, uh, connections of uh, several components. And they they follow most of the stability conditions. So same uh, stability conditions, but for for two uh, key differences. Uh, the first being already talked about, they can uh, cusps are allowed, and uh, what's known as elliptic tails, which we'll talk about in a moment, elliptic tails are disallowed. An elliptic tail is a component that has uh, genus one, component with genus one, and one either marked point or node. Well, if it's a component, then that, that, that is going to be a node. So for example, this here uh, is an elliptic tail. And we, we disallow those uh, for pseudo-stable curves. But other than that, they're, they're all about the same. Uh, so to, to go back to the, the spectrum here, if over here is like uh, uh, fighting Cthulhu, and over here is like fighting Seth, uh, this is like fighting a bear. You know, it's one step up uh, from that. Uh, but in the, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it's still pretty closely related. Um, and now, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, I'm losing a fight against a bear. But if I had a, a ray gun that could zap a bear and turn it into Seth, still probably losing that fight. But I got a better shot, at least. I'm taking my chances there. And, and our ray gun, in this case, is going to be a stack morphism. If you don't know what a stack is, that's OK. Do what I do and just ignore it and replace it with the word set. And half the time, it'll be OK. Uh, <laughs> And this is a, a morphism from the moduli space of stable curves of genus G and N marked points. Uh, that's, that's where these live, stable curves. To the moduli space of pseudo-stable curves, that's the PS for pseudo-stable, of genus G and N marked points. Is it okay if I think of them as like functors instead of sets? Is that, is that, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, right? I, was, I was more so talking to the, uh, like the, the new faces in the room. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then it's a morphism of functors. Like, yeah. I, I just don't know anything about stacks. So, I just, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, with these two types of curves being largely the same, uh, with the big difference being that we, we trade elliptic tails uh, for cusps, this is a, a morphism that's largely the identity, other than in the case when we have uh, an elliptic tail. And then we trade that elliptic tail, T for trade. Uh, we trade that elliptic tail for a cusp. And, and other than that, you know, it's, it's the identity, but we trade elliptic tails for cusps, it's like contracting it down to a cusp. Um, but we, we want to go the other way. We want, we want a ray gun that, that takes bears, turns them into people. Uh, and so we, for that, we look at the, the pullback. And this pullback is going to be a ring homomorphism. Uh, on chow rings. And I'll talk more about that, what a chow ring is in a moment. But it's the pullback from the, the chow ring of pseudo-stable MGN bar to the chow ring of stable MGN bar. And so if I have the uh, class of a pseudo-stable curve, something like this, uh, that has a, a point on it and a cusp, that cusp gets traded out for an elliptic tail over here. Other than that, it's the identity. And this uh, is our main tool that gets everything started, because uh, pseudo-stable curves 
Uh, those are new and, and unknown, but if we can pull them back to stable curves, there's a lot of theory that's been done here. Uh, and so we're, we're related, a lot of the story here today is the relation, uh, relationship between these two types of curves, and that's done through uh, this pullback here. Do you, do you know if that map's injective, the pullback homomorphism? Injective. I think it is. Um, I'm trying to think of two different things that would map to the same thing, and I can't, I can't think of something. Uh, you know, I, 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 okay. I, you know, I don't know if it's injective. It's just a curiosity. Right. Yeah, yeah, as far as I know it is. Um, yeah, go with that. Any other questions about what you see on the board here? Will I, will I erase some of it? This is basically, I mean, just taking the same map, like it's not an actual reverse map on the spaces, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Same map, just pulling it back. Yeah. Um, now, not everybody here is going to be comfortable with the chattering, and I know for at least some of you I can say the word uh, uh, cohomology, and that'll, that'll resonate. So, uh, chattering and cohomology are not the same in general, uh, but with what we have here today, they are. So, you know, when I say chattering, you say cohomology. Chattering, cohomology. There you go. Uh, if, that, if that works better for you. Um, but for those of you that haven't seen either of those things, I'll, I'll say, you know, a word or two about what the uh, chattering is and the chattering uh, of any old variety is a graded ring. So it's a direct sum of uh, many uh, parts where the, the grading is given by codimension. Meaning that it's, it's additive, uh, the codimension is additive when you multiply two elements together in this ring, and multiplication uh, is given by intersection. And it's only a clean intersection if, the, uh, if they intersect transversely. And I won't get into the uh, non-transverse uh, intersections. But that's how you can think about it. And uh, addition in this ring is union. And the reason we start putting brackets around them, these square brackets, like over here, uh, you know, no brackets, now all of a sudden there's brackets. That's to denote that these curve, that we're now working in the, the chow ring uh, instead of the, the moduli space of curves. And everything that's uh, in this class is everything that has the same topological type. Um, so any other pseudostable curve that has one hole, one cusp, and one marked point would uh, be in the same class here. Okay. So, uh, these classes of curves, they are not the only um, objects living in uh, uh, the chow ring. And uh, there's two types of objects in particular that we're going to really care about, those being psi classes and lambda classes. And those are important objects in gromov witten theory. Again, think string theory, physics. A lot of their computations end up boiling down to uh, these two types of classes, uh, psi classes and lambda classes. And so that's why we, we care about them here. I think I'm going to need a little bit more room to get this going. Okay. So let's start with uh, psi classes. And we'll start with stable uh, psi, psi classes to get our, our feet wet first. Stable psi classes. Okay. And a, a psi class is an example of a uh, churn class. Let me just get the notation on the board first, then I'll break it down. It's the first churn class of the cotangent line bundle. Uh, and this is in the codimension one part of the, the challenge. So uh, that C there is for a uh, churn class. And a churn class is a uh, geometric object associated to a uh, vector bundle that very rarely comes with a nice picture, uh, so you won't be getting one here. Uh, and I just think about them as some geometric objects associated to a, a vector bundle. Uh, the one tells me that it's codimension one. Uh, the L is for cotangent line bundle, and that's something I can uh, somewhat talk about. 
and that I down there is telling us that it, it's the cotangent line bundle over the uh, point PI. So this corresponds to the ith marked point. So if n of m to choose. Okay, but what is this, what is this cotangent line bundle? Well, it's a, a bundle over the uh, moduli space of curves uh, where the, the fiber uh, over any points in the moduli space and a, a point in the moduli space is a curve together with n marked points. The fiber of that is the uh, cotangent uh, line bundle or line, line at uh, the following notation uh, at the point uh, PM. So if you're like me and have no idea how to picture a cotangent line bundle, maybe you know a, a tangent line, um, and this is the, the dual of that. And so if we have one of our uh, stable curves, and we pick, uh, say, that marked point P1, you can imagine uh, all the tangent lines at that point might make up the, the tangent line bundle. Uh, and then whatever the dual of that is, that's the cotangent line bundle. Uh, but so, so it's not a cotangent line bundle, it's the cotangent space. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah cotangent space. I'm getting my terminology mixed up. Well, you put, you put it together into a line bundle, though, right? Like, like the, oh, yeah, the TEPI, yeah. sorry, is a yeah, cotangent space. space. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The fiber yeah, I guess it shouldn't be, yeah. That's the fiber at that point. And then and LI is the line bundle. The line. There right. we go. Right. Um, okay, so... If that, the, the, the key part uh, here is that it's associated to a point. Maria? Can I ask like, silly questions about stacks? I, I don't know a lot about stacks. <laughs> okay. um, so I'm just wondering, like, is this chowering of a stack, like, I don't know how to define it. Um, are you kind of like defining it as the cohomology ring, or is there like actually like rational equivalence on uh, there, there is rational equivalence. Um, I think in this space, it, the rational equivalence is like topological type. Uh, so everything in the same topological type goes in the same class. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do think chow rings in general are rational equivalence is what that, that equivalence is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good question. And, and you can still have line bundles over stacks too? I, just, <laughs> I don't know how I, I regret bringing up the word stack because I, I don't know enough about stacks to, to take questions about it, unfortunately. I guess, am I also thinking of a line bundle as a functor then? Like, just like when you have a line bundle as like a big space mapping to a smaller space with certain fibers, I guess it's like a big stack mapping to a little stack. Yeah, we can, sure. Is that like that? This kind of stack locally yeah. looks like CN mod a finite group. Okay. Or you should think of it, since it's a stack, as CN with the action of a finite group. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a line bundle over that is locally a line bundle over CN mm. together yeah. with an action of the group. Oh, okay. That actually makes more sense. Okay. So this is a stable psi class, a pseudo-stable, let's write P, S, uh, psi class is defined the same way, but we start our, our building from a, a pseudo-stable curve instead of a, a stable curve. And so our P, S for pseudo-stable, this is the first Turing class of the cotangent line bundle over the points, mar marked points on the uh, pseudo-stable curve. And this is in the co-dimension one piece of the uh, chow ring of the moduli pseudo-stable MGN bar. Um, but all of these things, you know, replace the words, you know, uh, well, all the same words, just C is pseudo-stable instead of stable. And so uh, if we want to deal with uh, pseudo-stable curves, remember our, our, our ray gun from earlier, that, that pullback, um, what is the, the pullback of one of these uh, pseudo-stable psi classes? And this is a, a theorem due to uh, Renzo Cavalieri. Um, now forgetting, let's see, uh, Joel Galagos, Dustin Ross, Brandon Van Over, and Jonathan Wise in 2022. See these names a lot today. Uh, and they show the pullback of one of these 
have pseudo-stable side classes is exactly the stable side class, uh, which is very nice. But the reason for that is, if you remember that the, the, this pullback, it doesn't do anything to the marked points. And um, so these marked points are unaffected, and uh, side classes correspond to marked points, and so nothing is changing around the marked points. And, and this is nice, because now pseudo-stable side classes are exactly as difficult as working with stable side classes. And going back to the metaphor, maybe this is like, uh, like a baby bear, which may be on par with, with fighting Seth. I don't know. Um, as long as the mom bear isn't around, we should be OK. And the, the mom bear in this analogy would be uh, lambda classes. The lambda classes, once they come into the, uh, the mix, that's when things get uh, uh, real messy. Let me. So like the pathological rings don't quite line up with the side classes do? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So let's start again with uh, stable uh, lambda classes. And these, again, are an example of a Charon class. And the ith lambda class is defined to be the ith Charon class of the Hodge bundle. And this lives in the co-dimension i piece of the, the Chapman. And again, the, the i tells me uh, the co-dimension. And E is for, I guess, Haji bundly. I don't know why they, they picked E for this, but uh, you know, it is what it is. Hodge bundle. Uh, now, what is the Hodge bundle? Which another example of a uh, vector bundle. This time, usually not a line bundle. It's a, a vector bundle over the moduli space of curves, where again, we're going to look at the fiber. The fiber over a point, which is a curve together uh, with a bunch of marked points. Uh, is the following. It's the set of global sections of the cotangent space of your curve. Okay, now, now what on earth is that? Well, uh, this here is a uh, g-dimensional uh, vector space. And the, the cotangent space of a curve, notice there's, there's no particular point here. Uh, this is uh, the disjoint union of the cotangent spaces over every point uh, on your curve. So it's sort of same picture. Uh, as earlier, but now this is uh, over every point. So including uh, cusps and nodes, uh, and that's why uh, these are a little bit tougher to deal with, because um, our map is not going to uh, preserve every point, it just preserves the uh, marked points. The pseudo-stable version of this is defined in the exact same way, and the question is going to be, uh, you know, what is the, the pullback of that? Let me briefly write that on the board. The pseudo-stable uh, lambda class. We're going to write PS for pseudo stable. Same thing, same definition, just we're starting with a uh, pseudo stable curve instead of a uh, stable curve. And so, pull out our ray gun. Uh, we pull it back, and what do we get? Well, this is another theorem due to the same uh, group of people in the same paper. And they show the pullback of one of these pseudo-stable lambda classes is the following. It's not one thing. It's certainly not just the stable counterpart. It's a sum from 0 to i of 1 over k factorial of, and I'll, I'll, there's going to be some new notation here, and I'll explain what it all is in a moment. Okay, so I haven't finished writing the theorem yet, but uh, I've introduced a graph. And this is a graph where each one of these vertices represents a component, uh, like we had on the board earlier. And the number inside the node, uh, inside the vertex, tells me the genus of that component. And these dots here are for uh, k elliptic tails, because that's what these are. 
This is a, a genus one with a, a node, so an elliptic tail. Uh, and there's also a lambda class down here. And I write it there because uh, there's a Hodge bundle not over just the entire space, but over each individual component. And writing it there uh, signifies that it's, it corresponds to the Hodge bundle over that component. And so you can see um, it's a lot worse, right? Uh, a, a lot tougher to, to work with. And imagine like multiplying two of these things together. You know, multiplying two of these things together, I've got to multiply uh, two of these giant sums so the algebra, uh, you know, gets gets tough real quick. And this is the, the source of, uh, you know, all the work that I do. It's, if I do anything with pseudostable lambda classes, I start by pulling them back first and then figuring out what this big sum is going to uh, reduce everything to. Okay. So now I want to get, now that we've introduced the main players of the game, we've introduced psi classes, lambda classes, and their uh, pseudo-stable uh, counterparts, let's now talk about what a, a Hodge integral is. So a Hodge integral uh, is an integral, and I'll talk about what integrals are in a, in a moment, over the moduli space uh, of curves of a polynomial of psi classes and lambda classes where a uh, polynomial of these, you know, maybe as an example, might look like the, the following, like psi 1, psi 2, plus psi 1 squared, plus psi 1 lambda 1, plus lambda 2, you know, uh, a sum of a bunch of psi classes and uh, lambda classes. And uh, I talked about integrals last term, but I'll remind you here that an integral over a variety is a map from the Chowering of that variety to the, the rationals or the integers, depending on how, how you want to think about it, where it takes a cycle and tells you the uh, number of points in the intersection. So if I have a, a product of two cycles, C1 and C2, uh, how many points are in that intersection? And so up here I'd be you know, how many points are in this intersection, and in that intersection, that intersection, uh, and so on. Uh, like as an example, if we go back to uh, P2. Sorry, uh, the go. red thing that you wrote down is an example of F? Yeah, it's an example uh, of F. Yeah, I could have coefficients as well, you know, three. Uh, sure. okay. Yeah, example of an F. Um, if I was integrating over P2 and I had a line intersecting a line, I would expect, well, I just expect these two lines intersect in one point, and so the answer here uh, is one. And uh, these are the kind of things that I compute, uh, but on the, the pseudostable variety. So as you might guess, a pseudostable Hodge integral uh, is defined the exact same way. Uh, but over the moduli space of pseudostable curves, and we have uh, pseudostable psi classes. And pseudostable uh, lambda classes. And uh, for computing these, we use our, our pullback uh, ring homomorphism. And uh, actually, the, the same authors as earlier uh, showed that all pseudostable Hodge integrals are equal to their stable counterpart after uh, you pull them back. And this is more so uh, in line with the, the kind of work that I do, is I, I take certain classes of pseudostable Hodge integrals, I pull them back, and see is there a nice uh, formula for these things in certain cases. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what types of pseudostable Hodge integrals have already been uh, classified and worked on, and I'll show you where uh, quadratic pseudostable Hodge integrals come in and what we did. Okay, so uh, these are some results by the uh, same group of people. 
R for Renzo, Gallieri, Galagos, uh, Ross, Van Over, and Wise. And they started with the, the easiest bunch. They said, okay, what if I have a pseudo-stable Hodge integral of just psi classes? Well, we know that the pullback of a pseudo-stable psi class is a stable psi class, and so this is equal to exactly its stable counterpart. And once we've gotten something that's stable, it's sort of not our problem anymore. Um, and a lot of the story here is not just like getting an answer, it's like talking about the relationship between these two types of Hodge integrals, which in this case, you know, they were equal. So that's just psi classes. Uh, what happens if we bring in just one uh, lonely lambda class? So lambda i times a, a polynomial of psi classes. This one is not as, as obvious. Um, you know, you pull back these psi classes and you still get stable psi classes. You pull back this one, you get the, the big monstrosity I showed you earlier, the, the, the big sum. Uh, but that sum uh, happens to simplify to get you exactly the stable counterpart. And not obvious, but uh, you know, they, they show this in that paper. And so uh, we call these linear pseudo-stable Hodge integrals because the uh, lambda part is linear. This is a linear pseudo-stable Hodge integral. So you might you know, guess at what a quadratic pseudo-stable Hodge integral is. And you know, these, these first two cases, they got exactly the stable counterpart. And so first guess is, hey, maybe you get uh, the same exact thing in, in every case. And that would be kind of cool. And we'd have no work to, be, to do here. We'd have to do a different project. Uh, but they, they found some counterexamples uh, pretty quickly. And uh, one of their counterexamples was the pseudo-stable Hodge integral of the, the following. And don't get too caught up in the, the computation here or why this is the thing that they chose. But they computed this thing and got 1 over 24. Uh, but the issue is that the stable counterpart is equal to 0. And so, uh, in general, these, these two things are not going to be equal. And I left off the, the, the PS here because the notation is getting kind of crazy. If you see PS there, you know these are all pseudo-stable. If you don't see PS, these are all stable. And so right away, uh, we know that in general, these two things are not equal. And so that was, that was one of my projects is, um, can we come up with a formula like this uh, for quadratic pseudo-stable Hodge integrals? But one thing to notice is that this 1 over 24 is kind of a weird number. Um, and this happens to be the integral. Sorry, what, sorry, what did you write for the exponent of yeah, 3G, 3G minus, minus 5 plus n? Yeah, it, it just happens to be the uh, exponent that like uh, has a chance of getting you a non-zero answer. I guess I, I skipped this earlier. When you do a, a Hodge integral, uh, or any integral, to get something that's non-zero, uh, the co-dimension of your integrand has to be equal to the dimension of your space. That's how you get a point. Uh, you know, it, we're, we're counting the number of points in the intersection, and so if those things are not equal, we're going to get zero. And so, the exponents here just make it, you know, give you a chance against on this non-zero. This 1 over 24, though, happens to be the integral over m11 bar of psi 1. And I won't get into this computation because it takes a good, like, hour to do this computation. Uh, but this is going to show up in the, the general formula, so I want to point it out here uh, right now. And, uh, you know, after working on it for a while, we managed to come up with a formula. And uh, it's the following. This is a theorem due to uh, Renzo and myself. We got it last year. I haven't published yet. I swear it's coming out any day now, any day now. Um, but uh, we have a, a quadratic pseudo-stable Hodge integral. Let me write what that looks like in general. So 
So I have lambda i times lambda j times some polynomial of psi classes. And again, these are pseudo-stable because I see the ps there. i and j can be equal. That's, that's totally fine. Uh, but this right here that I have two of these makes it uh, quadratic. You came up with the uh, following. We got a sum from 0 to the minimum of i and j of 1 over 24 to the k, 1 over 24 showing up again, times k factorial times a stable, uh, let's see if I get my notation right here, a stable Hodge integral. This is genus g minus k with n plus k marked points uh, of the following. And uh, so we didn't get you know, the exact same thing back, but we still see there's a, some sort of relationship between uh, pseudo-stable Hodge integrals and their uh, stable counterparts. And I'll give you in a moment a little bit of, I won't do the actual proof, but a little bit of intuition for where some of these things came from. But one thing that I think is cool is that this formula generalizes both of these results up here. So that uh, first result, call it result one, uh, if you set uh, i equal to 0 and uh, j equal to 0, and note that uh, lambda 0 is equal to 1, so what would you get? You get a sum from 0 to 0, uh, plug in 0 here, this is 1, and you just get back, and well, these are both 1, because it's going to be lambda 0, and you just get back exactly this integral here. So it generalizes this first result. But also the second the same reason, just set uh, you know, i equal to i and uh, j equal to 0, and you still get a sum from 0 to 0, so this is still 1, and uh, one, this, this lambda class ends up being 1, and you get lambda i back, and that's exactly this over here. And so it, it encapsulates uh, both of those results on the right. Uh, any questions before I give you a little bit of intuition on where at least that 1 over 24 comes from? So uh, for three there, yeah. so G is for any, for the first result, right? Yep. Uh, for any genus, we have a 1 over 25? Uh, 1 over 24. So for any genus? Uh, yep. Uh, well, G greater than or equal to 2. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, G greater than or equal to 2. It might, it might even be any genus. But I know uh, for lambda 2 to be significant we need uh, at least two be at least two. So some appropriate uh, condition for yes yeah. oh, okay. um, but where uh, do some of this this uh, these results come from and the proof which will be the uh, you know lightest sketch I can possibly uh, give you uh, starts by substituting uh, the pullback of lambda i and the pullback of lambda j. So you get those big sums for lambda i and lambda j. And this is the part I'm going to skip because uh, you multiply those two big sums together. There's a lot of simplification. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, chaos ensues. Uh, but eventually, all right, many details. Eventually, uh, you get down to a, an integral of a sum of 1 over k factorial of a bunch of classes of uh, stable curves. Let me write what this is first. And this probably looks, this graph I'm drawing should look familiar from earlier because we, it uh, comes from the formulas for these. Uh, we get a, a sum of 1 over k factorial with a bunch of, of classes of curves. There are uh, k elliptic tails. And uh, somewhere in the chaos, um, you get a bunch of self-intersections that give you a psi class on each one of the nodes of these elliptic tails. 
And the, the lambda classes and everything else congregates down on the, the main node. And um, when you're integrating a sum, just like with Riemann integrals, you can distribute to each term individually. Uh, but also, with these integrals, if you're integrating the, the class of a curve, you can integrate each component on that curve individually uh, and then multiply them together. So, uh, for example, I can take the integral of that component, which uh, is a curve of genus 1 with one marked point, and there's a psi 1 living on it. And how many of those do I have? Well, I have k elliptic tails, so I'm going to get k products of these. And so I get uh, that integral raised to the power of k. And I also get the integral of this main component, which is the integral over a moduli space of genus g minus k, n plus k marked points. And uh, all of this was congregating, uh, you know, associated to, to this particular uh, component. <coughs> And uh, I Sorry. talk. Yeah, go ahead. Pause you. So uh, maybe you said it, and I missed it because I couldn't see. But the why do you have a psi one on m one one bar? So I didn't really uh, explain, but somewhere in the big computation, you get a lot of self intersections, and um, each one of these uh, uh, components gets a, a psi class on the node. Um, so with self-intersections, you get psi classes on nodes. And if I integrate uh, each one of these components, this is a, a component with genus 1. And when you restrict to that component, that node counts as a marked point. And so this is on m11, yeah. and there's a psi 1 living there. Okay. And uh, you do that for all of these. And you, know, you can re-index and call them all psi 1 if you want to. Uh, and so you have that you know, k powers of that. Is lambda 1 trivial in M11 bar? Uh, in M11, lambda 1 is actually equal to psi 1. Uh, OK, I'm happy now. And that's, I think that's what happens in the computation, is you get lambda 1 on these, and then you turn them into psi 1. Great. Yeah. Uh, but this here is uh, 1 over 24 to the k. Um, and I haven't told you, you know, why the integral of this is 1 over 24, but we're going to leave it as a mystery. Uh, but you raise it to the power of k, and you get this right over here. Um, if you want to see the main result, just wait for that paper to drop any day now. Uh, you know, I'll show you that uh, uh, then. Um, but but uh, this is our big result. Um, but I want to package this in an even nicer way using generating functions. I'm going to erase the proof so I can uh, look at that. So, you know, combinatorialists of the room, uh, if you s what generating function are these, is this number a, a coefficient of? Maybe if I erase that, 1 over k factorial, you might think e to the x. And how do we account for that uh, 24 to the k? Well, this generating function is e to the x over 24. And here the notation is going to start to get really tricky, so let me be careful. This is the uh, following. We get 1 over k factorial because of e, but then we also get x over 24 to the k, and uh, that is the following. 1 over 24 to the k, k factorial, x to the k. And so these numbers here, are uh, the coefficients of this generating function e to the x over 24. And I want, I want to try and uh, package this into a generating function. Uh, but there's a lot of variables, right? There's g, n, i, j, a lot going on here. And so I'm going to try to do this without uh, uh, actually writing the generating function. Um, and you'll tell me if uh, you're, you're unhappy with that or not. But it's going to be a generating function uh, of four variables uh, where the, the coefficients uh, of 
of the generating function are exactly these uh, pseudo-stable Hodge integrals. And in the actual theory, we package it a, a little bit differently, but it carries the same information, j minus j, and then f of you know, all our psi classes. And um, the, the stable versions you know, of, of this can be defined in the same way. Uh, oh, this, I want a PS there. This is for pseudo stable. Uh, same but stable. And what this is telling me, with, with a little bit of work, it's not, not immediately obvious, but um, this is a theorem that uh, the generating function for the pseudo stable Hodge integrals is equal to e to the x over 24 times the uh, generating function. Why you change it to g and i? Um, Just for the... Oh, g minus i? Yeah. It, when, when we, I didn't actually write the generating function, but when you do it, it it's a little bit more convenient. Uh, okay, but it, it's the same information, you know, whether it's g minus i or, or i. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, just for the convenience. But this is pretty cool. All right, the generating function for the uh, pseudo-stable Hodge integrals and the stable Hodge integrals only differ by a factor of e to the x over 24. And it's a really nice way of packaging uh, this information here. And this was uh, another thing uh, by Renzo and myself coming out any day now, any day now. Uh, but that's uh, our big theorem. These are our two big theorems, along with something I showed you a while ago, that being Mumford's formula. Um, and at the moment, we're trying to write that up. And then after that, we might think about uh, what about cubic uh, pseudo-stable Hodge integrals. And I've done a little bit of investigating there, and it, there's something going on, but it does not turn out to be this nice. Because uh, now you have three of those great big sums you've got to multiply together. Uh, it, it's, it's a real pain, uh, but this is where we're at right now, and uh, we're hoping to do more with this stuff. Thank you for your time. Questions? Uh, okay. What is expectation for the tri triple case? I, I don't really have, we don't have an expectation. It, you know, some sort of, uh, some that includes a bunch of stable Hodge integrals, but it's not as nice. It's, there's something else going on. We, we, we haven't done enough of it to get a conjecture yet. Maybe like very uh, simple case doesn't uh, seem like little generation of this formula? Um, we, we did some simple cases, and it, it seems to be in the same ballpark as this, but you don't just get lambda lambda. You get uh, other stuff in here. Uh, you get like side classes. Other side classes start showing up in this part uh, that don't show up here. But I, I'm guessing it'll probably generalize this result, which generalized both of these results. Um, and I guess the you know the the grand formula would be you know can we do something for for any polynomial or any uh, power there? Uh, that seems to be a, a long ways off. But there is also something 24 to the k showing up. Yeah, because all of these computations I raised it now. But those we always get these these integrals over m11. Tails, yeah, we always get those tails. elliptic tails that always have a side class on them. That's consistent. That's always there. Um, and so you always get this one over 24 to the k. Um, 